Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to 2 Kings chapter 4. Last time we were together, there was victory for Israel, even though their king, Jehoram, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So here you have a king that did evil in the sight of the Lord and yet experienced victory. Why? Well, all over the Bible, you and I read time and time again of the glorious grace of God. It's the same answer for Jehoram and the nation of Israel as it is for you and it is for me. It's God's grace in our lives. And as you look for God's grace on every page of the Bible, you'll see it. You'll experience it. That so many times we receive that which we don't deserve. Grace isn't just the the doorway into relationship with God. It is the very bedrock of relationship with God. It is not what we have done, but all that God has done. We, We are not the initiator in our relationship with God. We are the responder. God reached out first in our rebellion. He extended love to us first. And so time and time again, you you might even look at Jehoram and say, well, you know, you you deserve this. And anytime you do that, you have to treat the Bible like a mirror and then ask yourself, well, what do you deserve? What do you deserve in your life and for your behavior? And for your, you know, maybe you're here tonight and you're involved in something that nobody knows because it's one of those secret sins in, in your, at least so you think it's secret, and it's maybe a sin of the mind, or it's a sin that isn't so obvious, it isn't so open, it isn't so, you know, somebody wouldn't be able to point it out in your life, but, but is, is not that sin that's secret and hidden just as significant before God as one that's open? It is. And so what do we need to do? We need to cast our lives upon God and beg for his mercy and receive receive what is already ours by faith in him. And there's grace all over, even in the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a book of grace. And we saw it again in our study last time. We pick up now in chapter four, in verse one, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, pour it out into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she, sent, and so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. And so the oil ceased. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your son shall live on the rest. Our focus uh, in this man of God is Elisha. Uh, He took the mantle, you remember, asking for a double portion from Elijah, and he comes into this certain woman. I love that. I, I love those little nuances in the scripture where it, verse one just opens up a certain woman. I mean, this is a specific woman. This is a, an important woman. This, this is, we don't have her name, uh, but we have this certainty about her. This is a unique, specific appointment of God. And she's in a rough spot. She's a widow and in deep debt. Her husband has died. The creditors are coming to take her sons to repay the debt because one of the things that, they, that you was customary in that time was that you could pledge yourself or your kids a security for the loan. Uh, they don't let you do that today. I don't think it's a good idea. You would pledge other things. You know, you might pledge your house or your car. And so that if you don't pay your debt, they'll come and take your house. So it's the kind of, that's the kind of issue. But this is them coming to take her and her sons. And if you couldn't repay, you'd have to work it off as a slave and then they'd be caught up in a system that even though uh, at times they would have the, the, the year where they would release the slaves, um, most of the time you never got out of it. So she cries out to Elisha for help. And so he asks her, what do you have? And you notice her answer. 
And we feel like this sometimes. Sometimes it's even real. Your, your maidservant has nothing except a little bit of oil. I do have a little bit of oil. I have nothing, but I do have a little bit. Haven't you found that to be true in your life? Even in the most difficult time? I have nothing, but I do have a little. I have nothing, but then I do have that up here. I, I have nothing. I'm in a place of nothing. Now, it doesn't have to be just possessions and money. It could be, you know, how are you doing spiritually? You know, I have nothing, but I got this little the hope. You know, how are you doing in your marriage? You know, marriage isn't doing very well, but there is this memory or is this thought or this, this direction. And for her, it was practical. I don't have anything, but I have a little bit of oil, a small vessel, not much. And so he tells her to get all the vessels she can find, which she does, and a dramatic miracle takes place. As long as she poured the oil in empty vessels, the oil kept coming. As long as she poured the oil, the oil kept coming. When the vessels ran out, the oil ran out. I mean, it's miraculous. Now, we know that oil often in the Bible is a type and a picture of the Holy Spirit. So this becomes a reminder of the flow and the never-ending supply of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As long as we're open and empty, because the oil got poured into what? Empty vessels. Not full vessels, but empty vessels. Vessels that could receive from this never-ending supply. And you know, the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, you know, if we're open and ready, receptive to the Lord, he's ready to pour in. But if we're closed and resistant to the work of God, then you're not gonna receive the place of the Spirit. Which reminded me of the ministry of Jesus, remember when he fed the thousands. How there was a never-ending supply of food that came through the miraculous hands of Jesus They just had a few loaves and fish. That's all they had. And thousands of hungry. It was an impossibility. We read these these true stories in the scriptures at times like they're Sunday school stories, like they're flannel boards, like like the the, the kids are receiving them. And it's it's really exciting to receive them as a kid. And it's a great thought to think of the miraculous work of God. But it wasn't, it's not just a kid story to root their hearts in faith. It is an adult story, a true story of God faithfully taking care of his people when you trust him, when you bring what you have to him, where, where you speak of not what you don't have. You know, we have nothing, but I have this little bit of oil. But oftentimes in, in our challenge to the faith in our lives, we'll answer that question. You know, I have a little bit of oil, but you know, I really have nothing. And how you answer the question, how you approach it will really speak to where your place of, where, where you are in faith, where you are in trusting God. You can answer it like her and says, I have nothing, but I do have a little. And it just leaves the door open for a work of God. I mean, you can only go so long with nothing. You can only go so long with the trial. You can only go so long with the difficulty before you begin to think, this is is just never gonna end. I'm ruined. It's over. My hopes and dreams, they're just done. And and there you are in the moment. And, and, And it ends with, you know, it ends with, I, I started, remember, it's, it's like, um, like we learned in the life of, of Naomi. I went out full, but I came back empty. And when she came back with that testimony, that was a testimony of a bitter, angry woman. Where she surveys the pain in her life, she looks back to say, oh, I had a lot, but now look at me now. But the, the, the vocabulary of faith is, Yeah, it's a really hard time right now. And and I'm really struggling, but God. But this is what I do have. You know, there's there's an impossibility before me. I'm responsible, or I feel responsible to feed thousands of people, but all I have is a couple fish, and it wouldn't even feed me. What is that? Well, it depends on whose hands it is. That's That's what that is. It depends on whose hands it's in. In my hands, in your hands, it doesn't amount to much. Except that when they're bringing that and offering it to the Lord. Which is exactly what happened. And those thousands were fed. Jesus says, give me what you have. Let me show you. Go go over to John chapter 6, would you? Just by way of, of review of this. We won't go into it in depth. But it's enough to be reminded of the faithfulness of Jesus. Give me what you have. That's the word of the Lord to some today. He's calling out to you and says, give me what you have. 
Give me what little obedience you have. Give me what little oil you have. Give me what little bread you have. Bring it to me. Bring your care and concern to me. You might be saying, but I do that. I've already done that. And Jesus is reminding you, do it again. Pray without ceasing. Come and keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep pressing forward. And and so what happens? Notice chapter 6, verse 11. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. The disciples then to those sitting down, and likewise the fish. Notice, as much as they wanted. And so when they were, what does your Bible say in verse 12? Filled. When they were filled, these were hungry, tired people in, in a place where the only food in the whole place was a few loaves and fish. The whole, the, the, the whole can you imagine you know, we have events from time to time. We'll have a, a women's dinner or we'll have a men's breakfast. Can you imagine having a men's breakfast with two pieces of bacon and one pancake? You know what you're going to have? A lot of angry men. There's not going to be a lot of faith. I, I mean, I've been around the men. I'm, I'm one myself. And I know. So I'm sorry, guys. A couple hundred guys come out for a men's breakfast. Sorry, guys. Uh, you know, we've... We have two pieces of bacon and one pancake. And I don't foresee a whole lot of guys saying, well, let's just pray and ask God to multiply it. (laughs) There's always going to be a guy, well, I'll just go to Safeway. And so he'll go to Safeway. And there'll be a guy, probably a lot of guys that'll complain. Well, you did a breakfast and you only brought two pieces of bacon. And there's another guy, who's eating the bacon in the kitchen? He knows there's going to be a lot of responses. But who's going to bring it to Jesus? Like in this room today, in our church, who's going to bring the problem to Jesus? Who's going to finally just break down and say, I know we don't have much. I don't have much. What do you have? I don't have much, but I do have this. Who's going to do that? That, That's a legitimate question. Who's going to do that listening in on the radio right now? What has complaining got you so far? Has it got you where you needed to go? Has complaining built up your faith in the situation you're in right now? What has whining done for you? Has whining made you any stronger in your relationship with God? Has it made you a greater witness for the things of God? Has whining helped your friends see the faithfulness of God? What has has murmuring done in this situation? Has it made you a stronger witness? Has it made you uh, just dependent upon God more? And of course, the answer to all of that is no. It's distanced you from the faithfulness of God. It's caused you to doubt him more. It's caused you to turn to other alternatives to get you by, to get you through. Have you ever thought that God has allowed this situation into your life the way it is, and it hasn't ended yet, just for the sole purpose of of causing you to cry out to him constantly? I was reading recently in a in a book that we're going to begin uh, to, to go through as a staff, and, and I've been reading ahead. I've read it a few times already. And the author asks a really good question. And he said, what would have happened to the prodigal son in the middle of his trial if his dad would have gave him more money? Think about that. What would have happened at the pig thing was he's feeding the pigs, Dad found out what a bad situation it was and said, you know what, son? You just need a few more thousand dollars. Would he have come home sooner or later? Because what was it that caused him to desire to go home? The extent of the trial and the depth of the trial. God allows it. We're looking for the solution to get out and God's looking for us. Anybody want to amen that or are you just so convicted? You're like... Man, I'm sorry, so not very encouraging. Who's a, that's why I don't want to listen to him anymore. You, didn't you sing about inviting the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scriptures? And yet what happens? When you bring it to Jesus, it's blessed, it's multiplied, it's distributed, and people are full. You're full with the provision of God. That's what happened with this widow. That's what happens to every true believer, God filling us with the provision that we need. That God would bless us, that he would break us, that he would distribute us throughout our community, that he would make us a dependent people, not a religious people, not, not a 
not, not a people of just Christianity in name, not, not a group of people dabbling in things religious, not a people that are Bible knowledge but make no difference in the community, not a people that, that elevate anything above their relationship with Jesus Christ, but rather a blessed and a broken and a distributed people, including Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I was so encouraged that as we were listening to the missionary update today, that God for the very first time spoke to a few in our, a couple in our fellowship that said, I'm feeling, I just feel something about missions. But, but I wonder how many more when you come ready to receive that God's ready to stir your heart for some step of faith. Maybe not missions, but that when you come into this company of believers and you gather together in a church service in a building like this that you come expectant for the Lord to speak and expectant for the Lord to fill and then you you tell them get the vessels find as many vessels get the community involved they know how desperate they don't have anything either because you know they don't have anything the neighbor the neighbors couldn't help her how do we know that because they all gave her empty vessels where did all the empty vessels came come from all the other hurting people in the community And yet, together, it's a powerful force. And I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged that the Lord would want to use us by allowing our vessels to be empty in order to be filled. To be empty in order to be filled. Or even to the point of the widow. Not many are at this place, but some can be. No vessels at all. It's a humbling thing to ask your neighbor for a vessel to ask a friend for a vessel. It's a humbling thing that you're, you're obviously in a difficult situation. You know, you can think of all the excuses this widow could have come up with where, well, why, people know I'm a widow. Why don't they help me? And you can hear heaven say, why don't you ask? You cry out to Elisha. You ask your neighbors and your friends. You submit yourself to me. This is a, a time of maturity when your vessels are empty and the oil is low. It's a time of dependence. You know, there there are some people that have known Jesus for 20 or 30 years, and they're still living like babies. Still living, not knowing how to feed themselves, how to come and submit themselves, and the very basics of the things of the Lord. As we begin our new study in Hebrews very soon, in Hebrews chapter six, it says, let us stop going over the basics of Christianity again and again. It's stop and let's go on. Instead, the Bible says, and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start all over again with the importance of turning away from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. Let's move forward. Let's stop talking about the basic stuff. And let's just admit that our vessels are empty. Let's admit that we don't have a lot of oil. And let's bring it to the Lord and let him do a work. Let's just finally come. And let's, say, let's stop circling around the, the little things in our lives that, that we are complaining and murmuring and whining about. And then just circling around, so like circling the drain. And every year the drain, I mean, this is 2018 for goodness sake. The coming of the Lord is at hand. It's time. We need to learn how to study the Bible for yourself. We need to learn how to develop a prayer life, a real dedicated prayer life. Learn how to be consistent in serving in your church family. Learn how to be bold in stepping out in faith in your community. Learning how to watch the news with discernment spiritually, not attitude politically. Every news story is an opportunity to touch someone's life. A reminder of the tragedy of sin and the stupidity and idiocy of people that the farther that we are, the farther that anyone gets away from God, the more dumb we will be and the more harm we'll bring to people's lives. And you think of watching the news and making it some political thing. Politics have been around almost since the beginning of time. What has that done for the world? Jesus came into the world and he changed lives instantly. God sent Elijah into this widow's house and within a few days, life changed. Not only did she have full vessels, but she had enough to sell and live. This was intended for her to live on. 
This was intended for her to live on. Jesus wants us to grow. He wants us to move forward. This also reminds me as we come back to 2 Kings, not only does it remind me of the possibilities that faith brings us in the hands of God, but secondly, this miracle reminds me, and this will be our only, our focus tonight. That's, I just felt sensed the need to pause on this section just here and, and have God build our faith. So number one, it reminds me what God can do when we bring things to him. Number two, it reminds me of God's gracious supply. God's gracious supply. In the heart of God, he already knew what he was going to do in this widow's life. She didn't know it, but God already knew what he was going to do. He already knew how much oil he was going to give her. He already knew how many vessels would be supplied to her. He already knew. But can you imagine being that woman sitting there in desperation, in fear, and anxiety, knowing that in any moment she's going to lose her family to pay off a debt because there's no one to care for her, there's no one to take care of her, and, and the ones that would take care of her, they're going, to take, they're going to take away from her. And she's just sitting there, and she's just in a place of desperation. It's quiet desperation, but it's desperation nonetheless. And so what does she do? She cries out to Elisha. It's like the last thing that she does. You know my situation, and what does Elisha do? Well, what do you want me to do? What, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have? Verse 2, and she says, you know, I've got nothing in, but a jar of oil. Said so they go borrow some vessels. They weren't even hers. Borrow some vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. God wants to graciously supply you, not because we would think some of you have a more timid uh, personality that if Elisha came to you and said, go gather some vessels, you would feel bad if you gathered more than one or two. It would just, you'd just feel bad. As you assess your situation, you think uh, one or two would be enough. And then you don't want to ask any more because it's already embarrassing and you, know, you wish you had more vessels and you really understand that it's more gracious to give than to receive, but that's become a prideful thing for you because you love to give, but you don't receive. And so you would just say, I'll just get a couple. But he says, don't get a, just get a lot because God is ready to do a work. So go get those vessels from your neighbors. Don't get a few, get a lot. And can't you hear the Lord speaking to you? I want to do a greater work in your life than what you're experiencing right now. I don't want you to just get a couple vessels. Don't just get a couple cups. Get as many as you can because you're going to see the faithfulness of God. You want oil? I got oil. Think of that spiritually. You want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? God says to you, I have the Holy Spirit to give you. Take and receive as much of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just ask me. Just come to me. Stop living in your own wisdom. Stop thinking you're so Bible smart. Stop thinking you're some great teacher. Stop thinking that you got it all taken care of and you've been walking around and you're smarter and you're more spiritual than your mom and you're more spiritual. Stop all that. Humble yourself. Receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Say, God, I need a fresh anointing. I need to be filled by you. I, I want more vessels. I don't want just enough for today, but God, fill me up for what you have ahead. I don't even know what's around the corner. I don't even know what's going to happen when I get home. You know what's happening when I, I know what's going to happen when I get home. My dumb fire alarms, those little white things that they put all through the house, are going off like crazy. There's no fire in my house. Anybody ever happen to you? It's three o'clock in the morning. Be People are like, what? So you go change the batteries. Well, I must have missed one because it, we got it fixed last night. I get a call this morning. They're going off again. I'm like, well, do I need to go home? What's going on? Is we take it and unplug it? And it's like, so I pretty much know what's going to happen when I go home. The fire alarms are going to go off. Those little smoke detector things. And you can't just unplug all of them because they're there for a reason, you know? <laughs> But it's just a little minor annoyance. Just a minor annoyance. It just interrupts your sleep a little bit. It just scares the, head, you know, scares the heck out of you because, you know, my house burned down before. So, like, that's a, the things go off. And you're like, smell for sleep. What's going on? And, and it's just a minor annoyance. But it's a minor annoyance nonetheless. Some of you might be going home to a major annoyance. I don't want to minimize as we speak of faith that the situations that you're going home to aren't going to be hard, aren't going to be difficult. But it's because you've been focusing on the difficulty that you have no empty vessels. 
and you have no empty vessels, you're not going to get a fresh supply of oil. And you go ahead, come on, man. What are you talking about? Well, let me bring it down to you. You're the vessel. And you're so filled with pride and arrogance and anger and fear and anxiety. And as I mentioned, complaining and murmuring. You're so filled with yourself that as the Spirit of God is being poured out upon you, it's being spilled. It's not that God isn't working. And it's not that God doesn't want to work. And it's not that God has abandoned you or even removed. We're not, we don't live in the old covenant days where we have to cry out like David, oh, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's not, we have the presence and abiding of the Spirit of God. But because you're so full, let me put it in New Testament language for you, New Covenant language. You're so full, and maybe I didn't touch on what you're full with, but the Lord has already revealed to you what that is. Because you're so full, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're hindering the work of the Spirit in your life. And you've become accustomed to this brand of Christianity in your life where you're a Christian in name, but your heart is far from Him. Does that sound familiar to you? It's a paraphrase of what Jesus told to the Pharisees, to the religious rulers. You've got the, you, you talk the talk, but your heart is so far from me. And God is saying, empty yourself. And while we wouldn't say there's not multiple people of us, I think in the multiplicity of the vessels, it speaks to us of, of, of emptying yourself multiple times, of multiple things so that in the hands of Elisha, in the hands of our Savior, he starts pouring, and he starts pouring, and he starts pouring, and then what does he say? You have any more vessels? No, Lord, this is all I can find. Okay, then the oil. You're full. You're full. Oh, that the Lord would fill us. God's gracious supply. We have everything that we need has been provided by God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities, Paul says. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full. I've received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And listen, there's a promise of God to us. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, Paul had certain needs as a missionary. He had certain things that he needed to progress, to take the gospel and move forward. This widow had certain needs to take care of the debt and to take care of her family. And the way that God supplies is through giving. The way that God supplies your needs is by him giving you what you need. And the way that God supplies through the needs of congregations and families is through the faithful giving of the saints. Physically, giving, giving of time, giving of resources, giving of, can you imagine, can you imagine what the church could really, what, what the church, and I'm not speaking of our church in particular, I'm, sp- I'm speaking the church at large. Can you imagine what, what, what could really happen in the church at large if the attitude of giving in the church was like it was at Christmas? Because for a month, six weeks to a month, there is this sense of overwhelming desire to give. It's like on your mind. And so you're, you're, you're searching out the best sales and you're trying to find out the, what, what does somebody want? And if you get something, you're hiding it and you're ready to give. And you, you know, if you're like me, you hide it and then you go, maybe I can give it. No, it's not yet. And I want to give it. And you're just so caught up in giving. It, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I mean, for the most part, like, it's not about what you want, although you might fill out a list. You might fill out a list because you have to, but then you want to get back to business. What do you want? What would bless you? What, what do you need? 
How can I bless you? How can I encourage you? And for six weeks or so, the world goes crazy. Now, we get caught up in all the commercialism and all that, you know, how crazy it is. But set that aside. What you're really seeing is how even the world can stir up people with a giving heart. Even the world can do that. Even the world can say, this is a good time to give. This is a good time to be nice to somebody. This is a good time to find out something about someone else and meet their needs. Can you imagine what that would be if that was just the atmosphere of the church of Jesus Christ, not not encouraged by the world, but encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and that we just went around going, how can I meet your need? How can I help you? How can I serve you? What can I do to make your life better? How can I prefer you above myself? That is a testimony of the agape love of God. And that's why we look to the new year we really have to ask ourselves, are we the types of servants that the Bible language for the, what I just described is servanthood? The, the Bible language that is used to describe spirit-motivated giving is no greater love as anyone than this than to lay one's, down one's life for his friend. And in agape, even to lay his, one's life down for his enemy. That we would walk in giving and and the very beginning and here's here's the biggest issue when it comes to giving in so many believers lives and this could be a bible study for the weekend really so that the whole church but this is the group that god designed you guys out on the radio or watching on the internet here's the here's the here is the place that stops up the generosity of the church it's this is it so many won't even give a tithe to the Lord. So many won't even give a tithe unto the Lord through their local church. How do I know that? Because I have friends all across the country that are pastors that aren't a part, at least in their time right now, a part of a generous church like I am and have been for 18 years. An overflowing generous church where I'm certain that, you know, we don't keep track of all the numbers in terms of percentages and who gives and who doesn't give compared to uh, who comes, but I'm certain that there are characteristics about our church that are true in other church because you're still learning how to give. Maybe you got ripped off at a church or you're just tight with your money and you don't know how to give and God's gonna open up your heart. That's me, I describe, the reason I use that description because that was me when I got saved. I was just so tight, I, I was so selfish and the Lord had to teach me how to be selfless. But, but that's, that's one of the easiest things a believer can do is tithe. It's so easy. You can do it online. You can do it on, on you can do it, write a check. You can, it, it's so easy. You know, I don't want to share the gospel because I have to talk to a stranger. You feel that's so hard. And, and so, okay, so why don't you give? Well, it's so hard to write a check. It's just so hard. It's so hard to write a check. What do you mean? It's hard to put a pen in your hand and get your check? No, it's just so, you know, whatever, whatever excuses that come up, the, 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 the flow of, of God's generosity is being stopped up in your life at this one point. At this one point. A lot of times you might be in a church where you talk on this generosity and giving like it's just a way of pastor to raise money and stir everybody up you can give more. If you've been around here long enough, you know that's not, that's not how we operate here. If, if nobody gave another penny the rest of the life of our church, God will still accomplish his will. You just won't get to be a part of it. That's all. You just won't get to be a part of it. Every testimony is, oh, yay, look what God's done. There's a great thing going on in Peru, but you've never given a dime to mission. So what are you clapping about? Well, I don't know, Ed. Well, it's happy. It's good to see what God's doing with Sharon, but how's Sharon going to eat if you don't give? Well, you know, she's just going to go take a fruit off a tree, I guess, you know, and she can just go pick fruit. Or you can give. Yeah, Ed, but she should just pick fruit. No, you should give. You should give above your tithe and offering to the missions. It may not be to Peru. Maybe you don't have a heart for Peru, but how do you think she's living? You know how she's living? By faith. Who does she have faith in? God. To do what? provide for her needs. How? Through you. Through you. 
Sharon, has God ever rained money down on you in Peru? No. That would be a pretty cool miracle, though. You can pray that just like, you know, like, like you parents, you telling your kids at one, do you think, you, you think money grows on trees? It doesn't. But it does grow in your life so that you become gener- generous and you just give. And you give by faith. Giving progresses the gospel. And it opens up the channel for generosity. It makes us more generous. I'm sure that many of you, when you were giving during the Christmas season, it made you feel good. Amen? Anybody? Just makes you feel good. You're anticipating what, you know, opening it up, and then they, they, they open it up and they go, oh, that's just what I wanted. And you just feel good. It just makes you feel good. And then they open it up and then you see on their face, they don't say it, but you see it on their face. This is, oh, nice. This is not what I wanted. And you just want to pound them for that. But it makes you feel good. It, it opens up, man, I, you, you give and you want to give more. You give and you want to help more. You give and before you know it, you're looking to solve other people's problems instead of just wallowing in your own. And you give a piece of yourself. You know, the, the giving of the tithes and offerings in a church is not God's fundraising campaign because he will accomplish his will with or without us. The giving of God, the giving of God, what, he anticip- what I believe in the bibli- biblically that he anticipated in terms of, of giving within the church, one of the motives is not fundraising, but disciple raising. He's teaching us what it means to participate in what he's wanting to do and sharing in it and, and, and just being so blessed by what God is doing on the earth today. I was, got an email recently uh, and it was from a sister. She doesn't come to our church, but she oversees the um, crisis pregnancy center that, that we have running on Grace FM, um, Colorado Pregnancy Center, I think it's called. And she'll send me updates from time to time. And she recently sent me a specific video update of a couple who gave their testimony at a recent year-end event that they had there. And the whole purpose why they're on that video, that they received the help with their little baby, they received help on how to be a young married couple. The whole purpose that they were on that video is because they heard that spot on Grace FM. So they listened to the radio, and the gal said it. So cool. I'll probably have somebody post it on social media for me. Um, but the gal said, like, like, I needed help, and I didn't have anything. And the ad said that you would help for free. So I called. And they did help for free. And you got this couple here giving their testimony, holding their baby. And, and the guy is a, is a bigger guy uh, and, you know, strong man, you could see. And he's sharing how he was taught. He says, one of the things I learned from them is this swaddling thing with kids works really well. And that's just one of the things he's sharing. You know, I didn't know about swaddling. And so you hear a message on Grace FM, a little spot that's on there, and all the technology and stuff that has to make that happen. And then you got to make a phone call, and whoever has to make the phone work and pay the phone bill for Colorado pregnancy. And then whoever answers the phone, whoever volunteers, whoever shows up, whoever begins to train them, whoever gets involved in their life. And then somewhere along the way that somebody tells the dude, hey, you want to help your kid? Let me teach you how to swaddle them. And you're like, swaddle? It doesn't even sound like something a man should be doing. Swaddle. And yet he learned, and now the testimony, and say, wait, we see testimonies like that all the time. But do you know how much it takes? Do you know how much it requires in the culture that we're in right now to get all those little pieces to line up to that finished product? And it didn't happen without the help of the body of Christ, including you. It didn't happen. Because why? God's method is always the same, just like Elisha and the widow, and this is where we'll close. God uses people to reach people. That's what he does. He could do it much better with angels and himself, but he, is, he has condescended to our level to use people to reach people. And so in your giving, not only is God raising you as a disciple, but bringing it home to this church family, you are absolutely 100% making an eternal difference in people's lives. No doubt about it. Matter of fact, I think that we get so many testimonies and so many things happening that it's just sort of, you know, we have so many missionary updates 
that sometimes you guys, oh, another missionary update. Another missionary update. We should have one every night of the year. We should have 52 missionaries that we support that are coming back from the field saying, this is what God's doing. This is what God's doing. This is what God's doing. What struck me is that I've never met these people, but I'm going to see them in heaven. I mean, that's, I've never met them. I can't do everything, but what I can do, I can participate and begin to see God's supply for all of your needs. So I know that when you come into a congregation like this, you have needs and you're praying for God to meet those needs. God's gonna meet those needs. And I believe he's gonna meet those needs in such a way where not only are you gonna have enough for yourself, but like the widow, you can live on it too. And others can live on God's provision through you. That what God has given you, the last thing with the widow is what God has given you wasn't just for her, it was also for her kids. And you know who else it was? You know who else that oil was? It wasn't just for the widow, and it wasn't just for her kids, and it wasn't just for her neighbors. Do you know who else it was for? You. God performed that miracle through Elisha with the widow to encourage you in this moment right now about how faithful he is. And you don't cry out to Elisha today. You cry out to the one that's greater than Elisha, Jesus Christ, who once and for all has come and settled the penalty and the debt of sin and who has promised to provide all that we need. He's promised to, it's it's his reputation that's on the line in your life. After all, you are a Christian, aren't you? And you're carrying his name. He's responsible for you. That problem you have is his problem. The devil coming after you, knocking on the door, you just step aside, let the Lord answer the door and say, hello, that's my kid. I was just thinking, I was just reading my devos this week. It so blessed me that when Saul was, was met by the Lord on the, on, on the road to, um, to Damascus, as he was met and he stopped on the road, what did Jesus tell him? He says, why are you persecuting me? Which is Jesus saying, you put a hand on one of my kids, you put a hand on me. And that tells me he takes responsibility for me and for you. And he wants to meet you and me where we're at. And he wants you to get the vessels today. And he wants you to cry out. I know you don't have much, but get what you have. And present it to him. And let him pour it and pour it and pour it. Until finally he says, you got any more vessels? No, Lord, I'm full. All right. And he moves on to the next one. So, Father, in the the things that you share with us tonight, we just pray, you know, in in light of the giving and and in light of the generosity and and in light of the blessing of this congregation, Lord, that you just provide for the needs of our church this, tonight. Not, not, the, not to pay the light bill or anything, that, that, that's all taken care of. But the needs of our church, the bills that need to be paid, the debt that needs to get out of, some of the bad decisions, some of the difficulties when it comes to finances or the house or a lost job or a um, lean time a widow, a divorcee, just, just constant needs, Lord, that you promised to provide. You promised to take care of. Would you build our faith? Would you just pour out a special anointing of our faith? And I know that not only are you gonna provide for us, but you're gonna provide at the right time. It's gonna be the right timing. And you're gonna bring us right to the place that you want us to be in trusting you. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.